Uh, and thank you, Omar, for uh, inviting me to speak today and to come to my guest. Um, what, I, what I want to talk about this afternoon is an idea in progress. As you'll see, it relates happily to some of uh, the idea, ideas in Eshmael's paper about ruins in particular. Um, it, it comes out of a series of, of different coordinates that I've been working through. One is uh, teaching courses uh, at, in New York. Another is thinking about the future of post-colonial studies, and that's one of the theme, the broader themes today. Where are we now with with the post-colonial? Uh, in, in which uh, I first formulated the future of post-colonial studies, perhaps paradoxically, uh, in an article with the title "Post-colonial remains." So the remains are, I argue, the, the future. Uh, and also, uh, really, uh, trying to put those together in, in, in relation to, to what the post-colonial in, involves today. Post-colonial studies, uh, as an institutional activity, intellectual activity, has been, to me, surprisingly successful in some sense from when it, when, uh, it, it started, uh, particularly in, in Western universities. And one of the things that it's had huge, what, what's noticeable is that it's had huge impact on almost all the disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, from uh, medieval literature to law to theology, all of these different disciplines have, have registered the impact of the post-colonial. But actually, I think it's achieved relatively little with respect to the problem that was central to the life and work of, of Edward Said, um, that is, Israel-Palestine. And outside the, the work of Said and a, a few others, the post-colonial as an academic field has kept remarkably quiet about Palestine, in my view. More broadly, uh, you can say that, that it's also, in some sense, downgraded the, import, downgraded the importance of the Arab, Arabic contribution to post-colonial studies in general, particularly the Maghreb, in fact. Um, one of the things I argued uh, many years ago was that was the post-colonial studies uh, developed, in some sense, as a Franco-Maghrebian uh, project. Um, uh, thinking of writers such as Alberto Memmi, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Abdel Kebir Khatibi, or Abdel Fattah Kilito. Um, the Maghreb, uh, um, nevertheless, despite the contribution of, of so many intellectuals such as those, has received comparatively little attention um, within the, the field. So my, my general argument is that the post-colonial uh, as a as an academic field has, has taken the issues elsewhere, um, particularly to India and to South Asia. And in some sense, you might say that what began as an Arabic and uh, Arabic Maghrebian project uh, in Western uh, universities by <coughs> historic uh, individuals such as Said um, actually has been hijacked in some sense by the, the South Asianists, you might say. So um, my, my own project is in a way to try and move the, the, the field back to its original uh, focus. Uh, and that's one of the things I've been trying to do in, my, in the journal that I, that I edit, which is called Interventions. Uh, but also to return to the work of Said uh, to try to uh, identify uh, some kind of core of the post-colonial, or as we say, post-coloniality. Um, and to link it also to the heritage of the anti-colonial movements, which is how I see the, the post-colonial as having developed intrinsically from the anti-colonial movements in the 20th century. Now, what's interesting um, uh, about, about Said is that actually he always disavowed the post-colonial. Uh, he founded a field, not many intellectuals found a whole Field. Um, you can think of a few, Marx, maybe Freud, uh, but uh, and not many actually then disavow the field that, they, that their work produces. Why did he, why did he uh, disavow the post-colonial? Uh, basically because he said it was too early. But while the majority of countries in the world are technically, historically now post-colonial, they're no longer colonies, um, 
there are others, such as Palestine, that have not yet uh, acceded to that state. So if, if Said distrusted postcolonial studies, it wasn't just because he uh, thought it was too psychological or too jargonistic, though he did think that too, uh, but my, mainly because it was premature. Um, he felt that he didn't belong to post-colonial studies because the post-colonial was precisely what uh, he and all Palestinians were aspiring to, but which uh, for them seemed to remain ever out of reach. They were, as it were, in a perpetual state of, of waiting for the post-colonial. And it's quite interesting being here in Morocco to, to think of that idea of waiting and to compare it. Uh, to a different idea of waiting that's often expressed in Moroccan literature and art. Um, in, uh, for example, Leila Lalami's Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, or Tar Ben Jaloum's uh, Leaving Tangiers, as translated into English, or Ito Barada's uh, The Straits Project, um, or even the 1941 film Casablanca, where uh, people say, waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Um, and uh, <coughs> nevertheless, the Palestinian form of waiting is, is actually a different kind of waiting. Because here, according to the, the literary and other representations, waiting is often about, about waiting to leave, to leave uh, for Europe in particular, uh, apart from Casablanca, of course. Uh, <coughs> whereas the Palestinian waiting is about waiting to return. So it's a, it's, a, it's a comparable, a different kind of, of waiting. Now, Palestinian waiting led Saeed to, to argue that um, the Palestinians were working in a kind of anachronistic time frame, that they were late, as he put it, caught up in the dynamics of what, for the majority of the people in the world, was an earlier age of colonial resistance. He said, far from being innovators, we are latecomers, a people in the late 20th century trying to gain the right of self-determination that everyone else has. Not quite true that everyone else has, but most people in the world have achieved self-determination, but uh, the, the Palestinians are late uh, in, in relation to that. So the, the, in that sense, he argued, they're anachronistic, they're out of time, they're actually in a situation of not having achieved the post-colonial, not being post-colonial. Um, uh, and left with the intractable situation of working with the still unresolved issues of 1948, 1967, 1993, uh, and so forth. Now, what I want to do is to is to try and push Said's argument uh, a bit further than he did himself, and to link this this idea of Palestinian situation being anachronistic and late with the subject of his last uh, posthumous book, uh, which is called, in fact, uh, Late Style, and is indeed about lateness. Um, but what's interesting about that book is that he doesn't put this Palestinian situation at the center. It's almost uh, hidden, but of course it's an unfinished book. So perhaps if he'd written it, the Palestinian situation would have been at the center. And that's what I'm trying uh, uh, without his approval, <laughs> to do, uh, in some sense, on his uh, behalf. Because ostensibly that book, Late Style, um, <clears throat> which has been translated into French, I'm not sure if it's translated into Arabic, um, has very little to do with the Palestinian uh, situation. The essays in it are, for the most part, concerned with questions of music, above all, uh, literature, performance, and so forth. And the account of lateness that he gives there um, involves a whole s lateness in a whole series of different registers in different arts. A certain kind of aesthetics in music, um, drawn f uh, first from Adorno's essay on Spätstil in the late Beethoven, late style in the late Beethoven, by, but extended by Said into a sense not only of other forms of uh, artistic production, but also <coughs> implicitly to his own life, which as he was writing it, was also coming towards its end. Uh, he was himself living in the waiting room of death uh, when he wrote in most of these essays. Nevertheless, um, and he does link it uh, very briefly in that book to the continuing Palestinian struggle 
uh, as anachronistic and late uh, in relation to the majority of anti-colonial struggles uh, that I, I mentioned. And I want to, to, to link that, that idea of lateness that he develops there uh, uh, with the particular form of Palestinian literature and perhaps Palestinian art uh, more generally, which, uh, <coughs> uh, um, as Eshmael uh, has, has uh, already argued, and I, I would agree with him, actually come together in the form of, of a certain incompleteness, in the form of fragmentation. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, in the form of, of ruin. Now, what's um, uh, I think very energizing about about uh, Syed's book uh, uh, *Late Star* is that is that he talks about it as a certain kind of uh, creativity, uh, and uh, this is uh, the point where he draws on on the work of uh, Theodore Adorno directly. And this is a quotation from uh, Adorno in his essay on Beethoven. He says, the maturity of late works of significant artists, such as Beethoven, does not resemble the kind one finds in fruit. They are, for the most part, not round, but furrowed, even ravaged, devoid of sweetness, bitter and spiny. They don't surrender themselves to mere delectation. They lack all the harmony that the classicist aesthetic is in the habit of demanding from works of art. And they show more traces of history than of growth. They show the traces of history in particular. So I like that idea that the late works are not round. They're not perfect in that sense. They're actually furrowed. They look ravaged. They resemble, we might say, uh, a ruin. And perhaps nothing more than the central features of the Palestinian uh, landscape, the covet, the ruin the ruined village. And what's important is that this ruin shows the traces of, of history and itself, uh, as I think you were suggesting, amounts to a form of, of creativity or can be seen in those terms as a form of expression. The expression in terms of late style of a certain intransigence, of a certain doggedness, of a certain uh, obduracy, uh, obstinacy perhaps is a simpler word, uh, of samud. So Said's work transforms uh, uh, Adorno's uh, uh, account of lateness into a different kind of register, and he he splits it in two. He says, well, some late works really are sweet and round. Uh, we think of late Shakespeare, late Matisse, uh, Faure's late string quartet, certain works of uh, Schubert, for example. Uh, we do think of lateness in that round, sweet, perfect form. But on the other hand, there are late works that come across as difficult, unfinished, deliberately going against the grain of the consensus. And this is uh, the, the nature of late style in Beethoven, which uh, in particular the, um, the, the late quartets in Beethoven were people found difficult to listen to for at least 100 years after Beethoven's death. They, they remained, as it were, un, unlistenable to, you might say. So the composer or writer does this through developing an idiosyncratic style uh, of fragmentariness, through anachronism, through an unreadable mix of the difficult and the convention, according to Said, and refuses to try to reconcile the irreconcilable. Said <coughs> talks about it as, as a deliberately unproductive productiveness of a going against. And he says, uh, this is actually exactly the, the form of how Palestinians uh, uh, create and work. He says, <coughs> even in, in those circumstances, the Palestinian works anyway, often without much hope or horizon, with the result that alienation from work is now gradually being assimilated and transformed into a prevailing attitude, summed up and characterized by Raja Shihade, the Palestinian lawyer uh, and writer, as Sumud. Uh, meaning to stay put, to cling to our houses and land by all means available. Now, Samud, as I'm sure you know, means steadfastness, perseverance, uh, and has been developed into a kind of strategy of, of creative, non-violent resistance, which is exactly that. It's about literally hanging on to the land, uh, to the locality, refusing to be pushed out, uh, to, be, to be sent off to the diaspora. And the, the symbol of that, uh, of that uh, hanging on, that intransigence, 
uh, has become the, the olive tree, the rootedness, if you like, of Palestinian lives, connected with the kind of ecological idea of care for the land, for the environment, refusing its obliteration by the slow violence of militarized security, securitization, uh, the wall, for example, uh, the, the, the pouring of concrete on creative land. So Samud encompasses the larger refusal of Palestinians to give up their claim to their homeland, uh, refusing, as Mahmoud Dawish puts it, giving up the right to wait. So it's a kind of doggedness uh, uh, that is, is, is characteristic of Palestinian uh, uh, self-assertion. And this uh, emerges, I think, uh, very much in Palestinian writing and Palestinian uh, art. And it's that that I want to connect <coughs> to um, Said's idea of late style, which sounds rather rather different. It's about, about lateness, but actually uh, what late style characterizes is actually this form, this particular form of resistance in life uh, and in art. That is not resolution and harmony, but untimeliness, a kind of anachronism uh, that leaves you uh, uncomfortable, just like the questions that it persists in raising. Lateness, says uh, Said, is a kind of self-imposed exile from what's generally acceptable, coming after it and surviving beyond it. What's interesting in that description is that he describes it as a form of exile, a self-imposed exile. And that, that uh, allows us, I think, to link the argument in this last book of Said's with uh, earlier expressions of uh, the nature of exile, and particularly the nature of Palestinian exile <coughs> that he made throughout his life. So in 1984, for example, he describes exile itself as a discontinuous state of being, of dislocation, which he says in artists, in writers, is usually, I quote, translated into intransigence, willfulness, exaggeration, overstatements. These are the characteristic styles uh, of exile. Uh, and I think that, 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 uh, that remark, which is made in 1984, represents in a way the kernel of the idea, of his own idea of what I'm arguing is a particular kind of Palestinian aesthetic, which links uh, the, the, the state or the, the, the uh, media of exile with the media of remaining of Palestinians in uh, Palestine and the West Bank and Gaza uh, and so forth. In his uh, remarkable book 1986, After the Last Sky, about the Palestinian uh, identity and, and as well, the nature of Palestinian culture, um, Said already describes their Palestinians as uh, latecomers. He characterizes Jabra Jabra's powerful novel, The Search for Malik Masood, uh, as an extraordinary world work of late-blooming Palestinian uh, sensibility. And what's interesting is that, as early as that, he describes uh, <coughs> this lateness uh, this, and this uh, form of resistance, not actually in terms of content, but in terms of form. And that's what I'm trying to get at, that it's actually an aesthetic uh, it produces an aesthetic. It's not so much what is said, it's, it's how it's said. This is Said. He says, the striking thing about Palestinian prose is its formal instability. Our literature, in a sense, is the elusive, resistant reality it tries to represent. Most literary critics in Israel and the West focus on what's said in Palestinian writing, who's described, what the plot delivers, and so forth. Uh, but it's form that should be looked at. Particularly in fiction, the struggle to achieve form expresses the writer's efforts to construct a coherent scene, a narrative that <coughs> might overcome the almost metaphysical impossibility of representing the present. And this links up to, to Ishmael's idea about the, as it were, the absence of, of narrative uh, in terms of the event of the, the Nakba. Each Palestinian structure, says Said, presents itself as a potential ruin. But that, there's no connection there between what he later would call the uh, late style, but we can see, I think, that, that the basis of it is there in the idea of fragmentariness and struggle with representation itself, with, with narrative, 
uh, and uh, the linking of that to the ruin, to the Kobe, the, 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 the village, uh, the local uh, ruin. And Saeed develops these broken fragments, these ravaged ruins, these now empty villages, uh, these remains that refuse to budge, uh, I think, into a specific aesthetic of, of Palestinian uh, literature. In late style, the only reference to Palestinian literature is in the chapter, paradoxically, on the French writer Jean Genet. There's no analysis of Palestinian literature as such in that book. And it's, but it's in the, uh, the account of Genet uh, that we can make the, the connection. Because he, uh, uh, um, it's, 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 it's with Genet that, that, that we can, I think, see that uh, Asai's argument can be linked specifically to Palestinian literature uh, more than any other writing in, in uh, Arabic cultures. With possible exception, it seems to me, maybe of, of recent writing from the Lebanon, which in so many ways has suffered from comparable conditions to Palestine itself. Junay, says Said, uh, is actually the best chronicler of the Middle Eastern landscape. Um, and it's in North Africa and the Middle East that Junay, the famously the former thief, prostitute, prisoner, outsider, found himself most at home, identifying with a series of outcasts and radicals, uh, with Fanon, uh, Franz Fanon and the FLN, uh, uh, as well as the Black Panthers, and then laterally with the Palestinian Fadiyayin, who he writes about uh, in, uh, in his, uh, his book, Le Captif Amoureux, which is translated rather <coughs> badly as um, the prisoner of, of love, uh, which is, doesn't quite catch the resonance of the, of the title in, in French. And uh, Saeed presents uh, Le Captif Amoureux as, as an uh, uh, example of late style, fragmented, difficult, uncompromising, hard to read uh, and refusing to, to reconcile irreconcilability. So this kind of style, I want to suggest, is actually the, 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 the Palestinian uh, uh, aesthetic. And it's the form of Palestinian writing. Every Palestinian work, we could say, following Adorno, takes the form of notes on a damaged life, as he described his own work, Minima Moralia. Said's suggestion that uh, the Palestinian literature is, is, is constitutively fragmented, that it can be linked to the idea of ruin, can also, I think, be understood uh, uh, if we link it to Franco Moretti's uh, sort of chance observation in his uh, well-known essay, Conjectures on World Literature, where he makes the remark that, that seems very suggestive to me, where he says, historical conditions appear as a crack in the form. And that's what I want to argue about, about Palestinian art, that actually the historical conditions of uh, Palestinianness, if you like, appear as a crack in the form of, of, the, of the literature and uh, the art. It's a, bit, it's a bit like, as it were, the literal cracks in the form of the contemporary Palestinian landscape that is symbolic of its historical devastation, the loss and the lack of place the shifting internal and external borders, the endlessly redrawn maps, the evaporating cultural memory of a lost physical landscape, the continued ferocity of military incursions. All these cracks, all these forms of violence uh, appear, emerge in their own way in the literary form uh, as well as its, its uh, content. And what's noticeable, I think, about many literary texts from, from Palestine is actually that they resist. And I, here I would actually differ from Eshmael. It's not that actually that they, they can't produce the story uh, of the Nakba. It's actually that they're resisting the completion of the narrative because actually they're, they're um, opposing themselves to the assumptions that narrative itself offers, which is that stories have beginnings, middle, ends in a seamless easy way. The novel itself, in some sense, is actually totally unsuitable to the Palestinian narrative. If you think about the novel as a form, it developed in Europe, in, in France, in, in Britain, in a particular kind of stable society, identified with the rise of the bourgeoisie, the middle classes, 
uh, and the rise of their, their ideological concept, the nation, uh, uh, and assumes a political and physical and temporal stability. It assumes the stability, if you like, of a, of a state in the modern form of, of modern France, let's say. The prose form of Palestinian literature is not so much the novel uh, as the fragmentary memoir, as in Murid Barbuti's I Saw Ramallah, or the peripatetic memoir, as in the books of Raja Shihade. And where it does take fictional form, it's, it's often deliberately episodic, it's broken, unstable, uh, as in the fragmented, surreal, perennially disrupted narrative of Emil Habibi's great novel, The Secret Life of Said, the Pest Optimist. That book has, has no normative, normal ending, uh, <clears throat> because such narrative, the point about such narratives uh, about Palestine and Palestinians in, in Israel is that they're blocked, they're blockaded like Ramallah itself. The characteristic form, therefore, is one of frustrated movement, diversions, sudden discontinuities, a literature that memorializes for all time the effects of the inhumanity of things like the security war, the ubiquitous roadblocks, the fragmentation of the landscape. And we can see even uh, similarities in the style of certain critical non-fictional works about Palestine, such as Sari Magdisi's Palestine Inside Out, which in its own way is as painful and awkward to read as any late work. And even those outsiders who write about Palestine, from Jean Genet, who Said discusses, to Joe Sacco, the cartoonist, to Guy Manzabat in Ramallah <coughs> Running, write about it in fragments, or as in Joe Sacco's uh, comic strips, they write about it in broken strips, if you like. The simultaneous fragmentation of Palestine, spatially, its geographical segmentation, its zoning into A, B, C, uh, um, zones and so forth, the endless bureaucratic restrictions and limitations, uh, and physical forms of limit, to say nothing of its own historical stuttering progress or regress as a political entity, give it a very different relation to uh, space and time than typically projected in the novel form. So as a result, instead of the narrative time of normal existence of that assumed in, in Western European fiction, it mimics the forms of ruin, of the ruined villages that remain visible but invisible. That's not to say, though, that it's ruined in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of moral sense, but rather that the ruin is a persistence, awkwardly still there, um, uncomfortably uh, achieving unease. In the history of art, Said argued, and it's impossible uh, that uh, he wasn't fully alert to the resonance of the final work, the uh, final word, sorry, that he cites from Adorno. He says, in the history of art, late works are the catastrophe. And it's in that phrase, uh, with its invocation of the Nakba, that Said, I think, makes that connection. Palestinian works, in that sense, are catastrophic. And that's the nature of the, 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 their, their, their form. And in that sense, you might say that it makes perfect sense against the grain of uh, most modern literatures that uh, the central figure of Palestinian literature uh, is, a, is a poet, Mahmoud Darwish. I just want to finish uh, uh, quickly by, by picking out uh, uh, one more comment from Said that I think is, 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 is rather remarkable and uh, underemphasized. Um, uh, uh, where he ends the chapter on Jeune uh, with a very provocative claim. He says, um, <clears throat> I think it's um, wrong to say that in the 20th century, with very few exceptions, great art in a colonial, uh, I'm sorry, I don't think it's wrong to say that in 20th century, with very few exceptions, great art in a colonial situation always appears of what Jeune in the Captif and Re calls the metaphysical uprising of the natives. In the case of uh, Algeria, the cause of Algeria produced Jeunet's own Les Parabons, Ponticovo's Battle of Algiers, Fanon's books, the works of Khatib Yassin. Compared to these works, the works of Camus pales, his novels, essays, stories, the desperate gestures of a frightened, finally ungenerous mind. 
In Palestine, the same is true, since the radical, transformative, difficult, visionary works comes from and on behalf of the Palestinians, Abibi, Darwish, Jabra, Kanafani, etc., not from the uh, Israelis. This is where he's actually uh, uh, transforming his earlier uh, lament, which he made in his 1986 book on, on Palestinian culture, where he says pa the problem with Palestinians is not only did they have to, uh, did they have no identity politically, but they had no cultural capital that they could say was Palestinian uh, to compare with that uh, of, of uh, Israel. But in in uh, the in the Genet essay, he actually uh, argues not only that Palestinian literature, by implication, is the form of late style but that it's actually uh, better, more powerful uh, than Israeli literature. It amounts, you could say, uh, to a kind of cultural uh, intifada. Israeli literature, he says, is, is, is dominated by novelists who arguably write in the older Western liberal colonial sense of, uh, <coughs> of colonial guilt. And S. Yizar's remarkable 1949 novel recently translated into uh, English, uh, <coughs> I don't know if it's been translated into either French or, or Arabic, Kabet uh, Kize, which is, a, which is a, a story of a, Palis of a, sorry, of a Israeli soldier clearing out uh, a Palestinian village, would be a perfect example of, of this novel of <coughs> liberal guilt. And if we think of the novels of Amos Oz, David Grossman, you can see uh, uh, even traces of it in the recent film, in the confessions of the former heads of Shin Bait, in, in the recent film, The Gatekeeper. Um, you can see where they say that actually the occupation is unsustainable, even though they were in charge of the occupation. Uh, you can see this kind of uh, liberal kilt that doesn't have the same sort of currency uh, as, as Palestinian uh, uh, literature. What complicates this oppositional, if you like, two-state model uh, <coughs> uh, that, that Said uh, develops here, where he's arguing that Palestinian literature is more powerful than Israeli and contemporary Israeli literature, is, of course, that some Palestinian literature, Habibi, Darwish, uh, Said Kashua, and Don Shamas, uh, is also Israeli literature at the same time. Indeed, some of these Palestinians even write uh, in, in Hebrew. So just as in real life, uh, they are both separate and in the same place at the same time in this paradoxical form. In practice, you might say, what they've done is create a kind of one-state solution uh, that, that uh, uh, is very different from Said's oppositional form. But on the other hand, it's also um, uh, a, a condition of late style that uh, irreconcilable opposites are deliberately collapsed into each other. So it seems to me Said also anticipates this idea that, that uh, these literatures bring together irreconcilable uh, opposites that uh, whatever political solution may ever be arrived at. Finally, though, I think it's actually Said himself who, who in a way, could be uh, also uh, described as, a, as an example of late style uh, in our time. Uh, he not only identified it as essentially Palestinian, but he was himself that kind of a writer. He wasn't difficult, certainly, uh, in, in the way that he's describing, say, Beethoven, but his writing, nevertheless, over the whole scheme of his life, bristles with a kind of intractable doggedness and perseverance uh, of, of, of making uh, arguments for Palestinians, of steadfastness, of a kind of sumud, you might say, uh, for what he believed to be just. And the words of Adorno in describing Beethoven that Said himself uh, partly cites seems to uh, also, it seems, offer a good description of Said himself and the way his work continues to operate as a kind of generative inspiration for thinking about these matters. This is Adorno. Objective is the fractured landscape, subjective the light in which alone it glows into life. He does not bring about their harmonious synthesis. As the power of disassociation, he tears them apart in time in order, perhaps, to preserve them for the eternal. 